So, uh, you know, before we formally start the session, it would be great if I have a quick feedback about, you know, uh, the kind of backgrounds that you come from. So uh, I'm going to just ask a few questions and please try to, uh, you know, sort of drop the answers in the chat box. So first of all, let me know how many of you are familiar with uh, FEA, uh, finite element methods and finite element analysis. So if you are acquainted with this, just say yes. If you are not, just say no. Um, good to see that you're all so responsive. Okay, so we have mixed responses. All right, fine, no problem. Secondly, uh, to those who said yes, uh, have you uh, ever until now used any of the FEA tools? So by tools, what I mean is Hypermesh, ANSA, or any other tool. Okay, I see someone using ANSYS, Hypermesh. Okay, fine. Okay, that works, guys. Thank you so much for the feedback. And finally, one more thing. Uh, so what I've noticed in the previous sessions is sometimes people uh, wait for their doubts, maybe for the recordings or you know stuff like that. So don't do that. Uh, I have uh, inserted some specific pauses in the PPT that I'm going to present where we will be discussing your doubts. So uh, just park your doubts just until that moment when we uh, get to the doubt session and then uh, maybe we can take it forward. Right, so I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so guys, good evening and welcome to this bootcamp on Hypermesh Fundamentals. So, you know, typically it is my habit to uh, sort of gauge what is it that we are going to look forward to uh, in, you know, in whatever seminar, webinar or boot camps that uh, I am attending. So what I'm going to do now is uh, maybe uh, in the beginning, what we can do is I'll walk you through uh, what I have in store for you what to expect from this complete uh, you know uh, boot camp and then uh, we will actually start working on hypermesh so on the screen if you can see uh, this first half this is where i will be talking about uh, the industry in general uh, then we will also have a deeper look into the automobile industry we will go deeper and deeper until we reach the simulation department there, I will give you an overview of, uh, you know, what are the different tools uh, that are being used, how they are being used, and, you know, what role do they play in the complete food chain. And finally, um, I expect most of you to be freshers or maybe people who are about to graduate. So uh, how does life of a CA engineer look like uh, when a fresher uh, really enters into this CAE field? Okay, so this is something that most of you must be curious to know that, okay, you have entered the industry, you are learning this software, but, you know, where does this software really help you, right? Because uh, if you uh, have noticed, we have uh, so many, uh, you know, softwares that come into picture. So you have Hypermesh, you have ANSA, um, you have uh, ANSYS as well. And, you know, almost every uh, company is developing their own uh, softwares for different reasons. So one might wonder, you know, is it really worth knowing all the softwares or, you know, which is the most widely used software in the industry that maybe you can master. So stuff like that, I'll be discussing in this first half. In the second half, we are actually going to try our hands on Hypermesh. So this is, you know, the schedule for today and for tomorrow, we are going to go deeper into Hypermesh. So today uh, we will maybe just go through the very basics of Hypermesh. And tomorrow, maybe we can address, uh, you know, uh, how stuff happens in an industry uh, with respect to Hypermesh. Lastly, uh, to close it in a very, uh, you know, very nice note, what we will be doing tomorrow also is we are going to look at automation in Hypermesh. So this is another thing what Hypermesh is very famous for. You know, uh, it is very easy to automate inside Hypermesh. So we are also going to have a look at how that is done in Hypermesh. And um, what's more is we are actually going to address some of the industry problems and create an automated solution for it. So you'll be surprised to know how simple it is to uh, write a macro or maybe automate any process in Hypermesh. And that too, when you are actually saving some time for the industry. Okay, so with this, I will uh, start this off formally. So like I mentioned, the first thing that we want to answer is where does Hypermesh stand in a typical CAE food chain? Uh, okay, sorry to interrupt guys. Um, 
maybe uh, I think there's someone supporting this from scaling. So is it possible uh, to not have these notifications of people who are entering for me? Yes, sir. I'll, uh, I'll mute those. Perfect. Perfect. That would be great. Okay. okay thanks. All right. So right now we are having a look at the automotive industry and uh, we are not going to get into the very details of, you know, what's what, who's who. We are just going to have uh, an overview, you know, the bigger picture. So there are two uh, major terms that are being used in the automotive industry. First one is known as OEM, which is a, a abbreviation for original equipment manufacturer. And the second term is original design manufacturer or an ODM. So what are OEMs? Well, uh, as you can see on the logos on the right, you have Volkswagen, BMW, Hyundai, you know, all of those. Then what are ODMs? ODMs are, well, these are some of the prominent ones, Lear, Fossia, Varrock, and many more. So uh, I think your first impression would be, uh, you would have rarely heard these terms for ODMs. And there is a reason for that. So to address that reason, let us understand what an OEM is. So I'll just read out the text. An OEM is a company that purchases parts and equipments that may be manufactured by another company. So a classic example for this is airbags. So, you know, most of the OEMs, uh, none of them actually make their own, own airbags. If you have noticed closely, um, airbags are typically manufactured by SRS. So SRS in this case will be the ODM and you know, all the companies that are using SRS airbags will be the OEM. This is the simplest analogy. So uh, with that as a background, Let's move further into, uh, we are still in the automotive industry, but now we are having a look at, you know, the simulation department. So typically what happens is um, OEMs, they come up with their own styling. You know, you have this beautiful uh, curves and spoilers and all those stuff that is there uh, that goes into the design of an automobile. So whatever you can see with your naked eyes, that is what is known as an A surface. Okay. That is a convention that is being used. So uh, OEMs, they typically come up with these A surfaces from their styling departments. And this A surface goes to uh, your ODM, okay? So for, uh, for example, let's say um, uh, BMW came up with a styling surface, that would be the A surface. Then uh, let's say the product that we are looking at is your instrument panel or dashboard. So uh, you have the A surface for it. So A surface in this case would be, let's say if you sit inside the car, uh, the dashboard that you see with your naked eyes, you know, the topmost surface, that would be the A surface. So this A surface is now being transferred to, you know, the ODM. And this basically goes to the CAD team of the ODM. Now, the job of this CAD team is to create a B surface. So what is a B surface? A B surface is something that is uh, basically goes under an A surface, which is normally not visible directly to the naked eye. Now, one might wonder what is so special about a B surface? I mean, to those who are uh, maybe a bit acquainted with the CAD softwares, what you would say is, okay, take the A surface, offset it by some thickness and you have the B surface. What's so special about it? Well, the special thing about a B surface is the B surface will have all your fixing elements. So when one part fits over another part, there will be some uh, you know, features that will go into uh, this union. So some of them could be your welding bosses, screw bosses, clip towers, dog houses, you know, stuff like that. So it is the CAD team's job from the ODM's side to build this B surface, uh, you know, all these fixing elements, and then combine the A and B surface together to generate a closed solid. Okay, so now uh, we have uh, the A surface, B surface, the CAD team has filled it up. Now we have a solid part with some finite thickness. Now, this is where we as simulation guys come into play. So this complete solid, uh, by complete solid, I mean not just one part, the complete assembly. So for example, if you're talking about the instrument panel, for the assembly, you will have, uh, you know, your air vents, speaker grills, and, you know, instrument cluster, stuff like that. So all of this together as a whole, as an assembly, will go to the simulation team. Now, what is the job of the simulation team? Well, there will be different kinds of tests that will be, uh, you know, predefined. 
and the simulation team's job is to perform these uh, tests in the form of simulations and give an input to uh, the CAT team of the ODM that whether or not the design uh, satisfies the criteria. Okay, so now we are at the simulation level. Uh, guys, I know this is a bit off from a hypermesh as such, but we are getting to hypermesh really soon. But it is very important to know where hypermesh stands in the food chain. So just bear with me for maybe some five, 10 minutes more. Okay. Right. So now we are here in the simulation loop. So typically any simulation activity will have three parts. First one is pre-processing. Uh, often pre-processing is confused with meshing. So pre-processing is a lot more than just meshing. So yes, we have pre-processing as the first step. The second step is the actual analysis. And the third step is the post-processing. So now this is the most crucial point. So what are some of the you know uh, industry softwares or the softwares that most of the industries use for pre-processing? The answer is Hypermesh, ANSA, and then some more. So I think someone mentioned answers. This it is one of those many. Okay, so this is what comes under pre-processing. For analysis, again, you have different kinds of solvers or solver decks, uh, which are Abacus, Pam Crash, LS Dyna, so on and so forth. And then again, for post-processing, you have Hyperview, uh, LS Prepost, and so on. Okay, so. Our software, that is Hypermesh, which we are trying to learn today, it falls under this block of pre-processing. Hence, it makes sense that we have a deeper look into the pre-processing as well. Okay, so just a quick recap. We started off with OEM and ODM. Then we received a surface from OEM. It, uh, it was assigned to the ODM SCAT team. They designed the B surface for it. They created a solid out of it. This solid has now come to us as the simulation team. It's now our job to pre-process it, do the analysis and post-process. So what all comes under pre-processing? Well, the first one is pretty obvious. First one would be meshing. But when you're talking about a complete automotive assembly, some of the other things that also come into play are deep penetration. We have connections. And finally, the model setup or the deck setup where you give your boundary conditions and stuff like that. So meshing, as you all know, or maybe some, uh, maybe some of you might not be knowing what meshing really is. So uh, the simplest way to explain meshing would be the conversion from infinite to finite. Now, what is infinite and what is finite? So I think of it this way, okay. So let's go back to our eighth, ninth standard geometry. So there we learned that uh, if you want to draw a line, essentially line is a locus of infinite number of points, right? Then if you want a surface, a surface is a locus of infinite number of lines. If you want a solid, solid is again a locus of infinite number of planes. Right, so this is what I mean by the infinite domain, the cat domain. Now, when you are actually performing some kind of analysis, um, the solvers that we are using, they can't really operate on this infinite domain. So what we do essentially uh, as uh, pre-processing engineers is we break down this CAD into a language that our solvers can understand. So this process of translating the CAD, the infinite domain into something finite, that is what is known as meshing. Okay, so um, there is a lot that can be said about meshing, but I think this is by far the simplest uh, definition that I can uh, put it into. Okay, now you have meshing. Next comes deep penetration. So as you can imagine, uh, let's say you have a circle or let's say you have a hole and there is a shaft that fits into this hole. So now a uh, hole essentially is something that is made up of infinite number of elements or infinite number of points. When I break it down into something finite, it will be represented by maybe an octagon or a hexagon or a square or something like that. And same thing goes for the shaft. So uh, when you imagine the complete assembly, it is quite possible that uh, two elements, elements are basically the building blocks of a mesh. So two elements, they might collide with each other. They might intersect. So this process of removal of these intersections is known as deep penetration. Okay. Deep penetration is essential for any kind of simulation activity because, you know, the solvers, they tend to 
either show an error or give inappropriate results when there are penetrations involved. Next step would be the connections. So as you can imagine, um, one part, uh, when it comes in contact with the other, there are different kinds of connection that can form. Maybe some parts are welded together, some parts are screwed together and stuff like that. So there are ways of modeling these kinds of connection in our FEA world, which is known as connection. And then finally, you will have, you know, the boundary condition setup. So for example, if you're trying to simulate a cantilever beam, your boundary condition here would be that one end of the beam is fixed to a wall, right? So this fixed to a wall, uh, this English phrase, we need to translate it again in a language that the software can understand. Okay, so these uh, this is known as basically boundary conditions and that is what essentially comes under the deck setup. So this uh, is a very brief overview of what happens in the pre-processing phase. Okay, and let me tell you for every step of this pre-processing, the principal software used is HyperMesh. So for meshing, you have HyperMesh. For deep penetration, you have HyperMesh. You can model the connections in HyperMesh. You do the deck setup in HyperMesh. So that is the reason why we are having this workshop because HyperMesh forms or HyperMesh seems to be the lifeline of the complete pre-processing and simulation industry. Okay. I'm not saying it is only HyperMesh that is used for all of these, uh, you know, these blocks, but yes, HyperMesh for sure is one of the prominent players. So now with this, uh, I would like to tell you about, you know, what would, what role can you expect when you enter, you know, this CA industry. So let's say, uh, you know, you are someone with a good knowledge of HyperMesh, you have done some courses, you have some post-graduation, something like that and you enter the CA industry. So typically for the initial phase of your career, say a year or a year and a half, you will be involved in the pre-processing activity. So normally what we expect is um, immediately we'll start off with simulations, but no, that is not the case. The reason is most of the industries, what they want really is they want their engineers to be very good in uh, you know handling uh, the complete uh, meshing ID penetration, connections, deck setup, and all of that. And only then, uh, as a senior, you will be involved in the simulation activity. Again, this is something that is followed in general by most of the industries. Next, uh, this is very important. So what would be the expectations of the CA from a CA engineer? So first one obviously is meshing. So when we say meshing, uh, you know, the, that's a huge list of expectations. First one is obviously mesh quality. So you'll have to deliver a good mesh. Uh, your mesh has to be very accurate in capturing all the features. You have to be very efficient in meshing. So by efficiency, I mean, how soon can you mesh a given component? Next would be your expertise in handling complex geometries. So if you're given a complex geometry, like let's say a composite, how well are you uh, able to mesh it so that is what uh, defines it, your expertise. Next are you know different types of meshing. So mid-plane meshing, there is one more application known as mold flow where you need uh, a different uh, kind of mesh. So you have mold flow meshing, hex mesh, tetra mesh, and so on and so forth. Next, as we mentioned, next comes the deep penetration. So here you need to understand you know uh, how to exactly deep penetrate stuff. So it is quite possible that you. Uh, you know, you do something which is not realistic from, uh, you know, uh, the physical perspective. So you need a deeper understanding of how, uh, you know, the components actually come together. Next is connections. So, you know, uh, different kinds of connections demand different kinds of modeling. Plus, uh, this kind, this modeling also depends on the kind of analysis that you are doing. So as you can imagine, it's a whole matrix of connections. Finally, what you have is the deck setup. So by deck, as I mentioned, you have different solvers to do different jobs. And most of the times these different solvers demand different deck setups. Okay. So lastly is this interconversion between uh, these solvers. So as you can imagine, uh, it's a lot, you know, the expectations from a CA engineer are a lot. And if you're, or if the industry that you are into, it uses hypermesh, everything is linked to HyperMesh. Uh, most of these tasks are also automated inside HyperMesh just to save the efforts. Okay, so with this as a background, 
it is safe to assume that hypermesh is your heartbeat for uh, you know any industry that is typically uh, associated with hypermesh so with this i would now like to formally uh, take you to hypermesh itself and we are going to uh, sort of actually uh, play with hypermesh from here on but before that i'm going to take a pause and let's have any questions that you have so far in the session okay so i'm going to stop sharing for a moment all right guys please, so oh yeah please add your questions to the chat box uh, and sarang like we will help you uh, look through the questions and we can pass the pass questions on where one to you oh perfect That's... that could be great so guys any questions so far you can drop it in the chat box prashant says uh, deck setup explain so i i guess like he wants more explanation on the deck setup right <clears throat> okay so uh, prashan deck setup so what i can say is uh, it's like using different softwares okay so um since you're pretty new to this uh, the simplest way in which i can explain this is uh, let's say you're doing one kind of simulation in any software let's say xyz then um if you are uh, sort of trying to do some other kind of simulation in some another solver then uh sometimes the modeling technique the way you are modeling connections and stuff like that that changes okay so uh that is why we need uh different kinds of decks because one particular solver is good at doing one kind of simulation the other solver is good at something else so deck setup essentially means uh connecting your parts together and finally assigning the boundary conditions so these two things together is known as deck setup and this module will be different for different kinds of solvers so as and when you progress into this industry deeper you will come to know what different decks are so uh, yes. then yeah there are uh, multiple questions about uh, deep penetration mm -hmm. uh, most of them uh, want like want to know what is deep penetration and and explained a little bit more okay um all right guys so uh i see a lot of questions that are coming from oem odms so let's skip those because you know um, our intention for this boot camp is to make you aware about hypermesh uh this general trivia that we are discussing we can also do that but then uh, your gain would reduce so i would suggest let's stick to hypermesh at such um and oem odm we can discuss that later so i think the question was about uh, meshing okay so uh, this is a good question so have you all understood what meshing really is because that forms the basis for hypermesh uh, if you have understood say yes or maybe if you have understood don't say anything uh, just say no if you haven't understood what is meshing is it clear we have a mix of yes and no So okay. I, I see, like at least seven eight people say no. Got it, got it, got it. So guys, let me do this. Um, instead of you know uh, making you imagine what a mesh is, we will actually see what a mesh is inside hypermesh itself. Okay, so uh, it will be much clearer then. Okay, so with that, uh, shall we proceed further? Uh, let's have a look inside hypermesh now. maybe if you still have some queries we will have it at the end of the session again mm, okay so uh this image that you see on the screen right now that is uh, your startup window for hypermesh um what i'm going to do is i'm going to walk you through some of the uh, basic icons uh what is located where uh, how is the general sense of things in hypermesh and stuff like that and when we actually uh, import a cad and you know actually do some meshing i will also explain what mesh really is okay so for now i'm going to close the ppt we are going to open up hypermesh itself all right guys so um, as i mentioned our job at simulation engineers comes into play when uh, the cad is ready right so uh, when we launch hypermesh the first thing that we would do uh, at simulation engineers is maybe we will import the cad so all of those menus are there here so i will okay just a moment 
Okay, so the version of Hypermesh that we currently have, it is the student edition for Hyperworks 2021. So uh, let's start off from the left hand side corner. So here, naturally, you have the first that is uh, building a new model. So that is what uh, is there here. This is your open. Uh, from here on, uh, the actual stuff starts. Okay, so now uh, when you actually start something, uh, you can import uh, different kinds of entities. So first thing is import a model. So by model here, what we mean is another hypermesh file. So that is not what we are going to do right now. Uh, import solver deck. So um, solver deck is something that I explained a while back. So if you click on this icon of a person here, here you are able to see what all user profiles are there. So user profiles is nothing but deck. You know, it's it's one and the same. So radios is one solver, Optistruct is another solver, FECO is again another solver. So uh, it's same as I think most of you might have used CAD. So you have AutoCAD, you have CATIA, you have ProE, you know, SolidWorks. So these different kinds of solvers, uh, softwares are available. Similarly, when you get into the simulation industry, you have different kinds of uh, tools dedicated to different kinds of simulations. So for example, if you are trying to simulate the crash of a vehicle, that would be done in a software known as PAM crash. Uh, if you're doing some other kinds of tests, they would be done in you know different kinds of uh, solvers. But the good part is HyperMesh can help you build the setup for all of these solvers. Uh, you don't have to actually uh, change the tool to build the setup. It's only the second step of simulation, which is the analysis part, which will change but the software as such remains the same okay so here in the student version what you get are three uh, you know three solvers radios optistruct and feco um, as such for the commercial version you have some nine to ten um, another solvers coming into play okay so that is what uh, i wanted to convey about user profiles so if you are setting one particular user profile here, so that is Optistruct for now, you will be able to import any model that has the extension of Optistruct. So uh, see, I know uh, since you are new to this whole uh, software and to this field as well, some things might be difficult to grasp at first, but trust me, the things that you need to know from this workshop that I will ensure that you have it crystal clear, okay? So if I'm not stressing upon a particular point, Trust me, uh, it is not something that you need right away. Let's take baby steps because this is your first introduction to the software. Okay, so here you can import either the, uh, you know, the different solvers or you can also import the CAD, right? So as I mentioned, for the simulation industry, we need to start off from the CAD itself. So that is why typically what we do is we import the geometry. So if you go to import geometry, you have all the different kinds of um, you know, uh, file formats available, IGES, SOLIDWORKS, STEP, so on and so forth. Then if you have import, you naturally also have export. So if I click on export here, what you will be able to see is uh, the type of file. So Optistruct again, as I mentioned, is one of the solvers. You get a option to export it into the different solvers as well. And then again, some other, uh, you know, um, options to uh, perform the export. So that is all about you know import export business. Uh, here you, you also have an option to export it to a PowerPoint and stuff like that, but let's keep that for later. Now, uh, HyperMesh again has three or rather, okay. So HyperMesh has three entities uh, where uh, which are used to organize the data. First one is known as a component. So let me open one component for you. So this first icon is for uh, displaying the CAD. This second icon is for displaying the mesh. So mesh will most often be denoted as FE entity. Okay. Uh, typically the solvers do not call it, call it as mesh. They call it as FE entity, finite element entity. So this first icon is for CAD. The second icon is for mesh. So now uh, in the graphics area, nothing is visible. That is because, you know, uh, it is hidden somewhere on the screen or it is not positioned like in your CAD softwares. So I'm going to press F. So once I press F, 
it is going to you know uh, fit into the screen now holding down control if i use the left mouse button i can rotate my model holding down control if i use the right mouse button i can pan and if i use the mouse wheel uh, into the screen uh, it zooms out if i pull the wheel towards me it zooms in okay so as you can imagine this is a cad uh, it is a closed solid there is uh, you know no missing surface or anything like that now our job as a, a simulation engineer is to first pose a pre process this into a format that you know the solvers can understand the translation part that i explained so let me show you how that looks like and then i'll explain what it is okay so as you can see uh, this is a continuous entity you have one surface attached to the other uh, you know you have these ribs you have holes and stuff like that so if i sort of do this translation that i am talking about the meshing part or the pre processing part this is how it is going to look like okay so what has happened uh, this complete continuous cad now i have broken it broken it down into some simpler entities so uh, the simplest building blocks that we are using are squares and triangles okay so now i think the obvious question that you will ask is this thing uh, the cad it is 3d and this mesh that i am showing you is a 2d so it basically does not have any thickness as you can see it has no thickness so what has happened is this mesh is created at the mid of the cad which is why this kind of meshing activity is known as mid surface meshing and this is the most prominent thing that uh, you will see in any of uh, you know any of the meshing activities that you do but uh let's talk about that later let's first focus on what mesh really is okay so i'll put this into wireframe now as i mentioned uh if you see the cad this line for example it is made up of infinite number of points but when we are talking about fea now we have broken down that line into some finite number of points and these points uh in an fea context they are known as nodes so this yellow dots that you see they are basically nodes so what is the significance of nodes so any kind of fea analysis that you do uh, whatever output parameters that you are measuring let's say displacement stress strain or anything like that all of these values are evaluated and stored at nodes okay so uh, if in your academic career anywhere you have uh, you know dealt with any of the advanced courses Uh, let's say cfd or fea there you will understand uh, what is the significance of the nodes okay so um, our points become nodes uh, in an fea context our lines again uh, stay as lines but you know lines don't really have much significance here the next important thing is the surface from the cad which is now uh, what we have broken down into a connection of elements okay so what i mean really is this these elements if i have hidden now so what this means is there is a hole uh, in the cad okay so i'm just trying to give you an analogy of um, how do we really do this translation okay so uh, for example if there was a hole here in the cad we have modeled it as a finite noded hole um, in fea so like i mentioned before again there was a hole here but we modeled it using uh, a square similarly uh, you had a triangular hole here if you noticed so again that we have modeled it using 1 2 3 4 4 number of nodes okay so this process of conversion of the infinite cad into a finite number of entities that we can count is known as meshing so why finite or why countable let me also answer that so uh, forget what i am doing just uh, no or uh, have a look at this lower left hand side corner of the screen right so uh, right now the mesh that i have built for this cad it contains 622 number of elements then again if i go to let's say nodes 
it has 699 number of nodes so uh, as you can imagine if i do the same exercise for surfaces uh, i will have lower number of surfaces but one surface is you know a big entity so we only have 37 surfaces but again this surface is continuous and the solvers that i'm talking about they can't really operate on a surface which is why we had to break it down into uh, these smaller smaller entities now to answer the question of 3d versus 2d so as you can imagine um, this cad is 3d and my mesh is 2d so to convert this mesh or to give it a 3d form what we do is we assign a thickness to this element okay so if i show you how a thick uh, okay i don't have the property assigned so just forget what I'm doing for a couple of minutes. I will explain what I'm doing later, but just for the visualization purpose, let me do it for you. Okay. Okay, so now if I turn off the display of the lines, you can easily see that this mesh that I have created, uh, if I assign some thickness to it, it resembles the original component in every way. So if I overlap both these components now, it would be difficult. Uh, it would be hard to tell the difference between uh, those two models. Okay, and this, in essence, is what we want to achieve as FEA or pre-processing engineers. So we want our model to resemble CAD in the closest way possible. So the most accurate mesh would be the one that captures the CAD as it is uh, into you know the required details. So uh, this is, I guess, uh, the best way in which I can explain the meshing process to you, or rather at least the philosophy behind the meshing process. So uh, are there any doubts? Are there any doubts still about what meshing really is? So uh, maybe uh, skilling uh, guys, you can help me out with the doubts, if any. Sure. Uh, so far, like no one has. Uh, if, if there are just two replies saying uh, yeah, they understood it. So maybe okay. we can move forward. Okay, great. All right. So I think uh, meshing part is clear. So now we can focus on the tool. So. I, we have started understanding the GUI for Hypermesh. Now uh, we will move further with the GUI and also about uh, some of the things that we need to consider while starting or closing any particular session. Okay, so back to Hypermesh. So one thing about Hypermesh uh, that you need to know is most of the commands that we operate when we are working on Hypermesh, they are associated to some particular key or on your keyboard okay so uh, in order to see where these keys are located uh, and you know some other environment settings what we need to do uh, before we begin any session in hypermesh is um, check for these behaviors of uh, you know this default stuff that is there so maybe i'll pull it down a bit okay so what i'm trying to do is so the menu is basically hidden behind uh, this zooms uh, window so maybe just give me a moment so guys, uh, the problem is uh, right now, because I tried to resize Hypermesh, all of these menus, they, uh, you know, uh, sort of changed their position and they are now appearing here. But nonetheless, uh, the simple way to do this is to close and reopen a Hypermesh session. But anyway, so if you press O on your keyboard, what you will be able to see is this whole menu that comes up. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to set how uh, different entities are going to be displayed for us. So uh, this is something that will help us later, but uh, it is good if we do this uh, well beforehand. So if you go to graphics, the first thing that you need to do is click on thick 1D elements. I'll explain what 1D elements are and how they are useful, but yes, this is the first thing that you do. Next is if you go to mesh, uh, just make sure that this option of advanced string mesh is set to keep mesh, at least for the beginning. Okay, uh, the significance of both of these things, I'll explain in a while, so don't worry about that. Okay, so these are the 
uh, settings that you need to do immediately when you start Hypermesh. Next, uh, one good part about Hypermesh is whatever settings you do, once you close a session in Hypermesh, uh, Hypermesh has a habit of writing down uh, the history of the previous session. So if you close the session, uh, you will see Hypermesh writing two files. Uh, one is hmmenu.set, and I think the second one would be hw settings or something like that. So the significance of these files is uh, whatever changes the user does to the default GUIs and the default behaviors, they are saved by Hypermesh. So next time when you launch this session, you won't need to, uh, you know, sort of do this complete thing again. Now, sometimes it might happen that uh, in case you're using a shared machine, uh, someone else might have changed the settings and you don't know what's happening or what's going on. So uh, what you have to do essentially is just delete these files. So I'm going to show you where these files are located. So if you go to documents, that is your default working directory for Hypermesh. And these are the three files that I was talking about. First one is command, next is HW settings, and the last one is HM menu. So if you just delete these files, then Hypermesh will be, you know, uh, restored back to uh, the default factory settings and you can uh, safely do your changes. Another important file that we need to uh, keep in mind is this command.tcl file, okay? So one good part about Hypermesh is whatever command you execute, uh, whatever uh, code is being executed inside Hypermesh, that is being simultaneously written into this command.tcl file. So uh, this file essentially is going to be our one uh, very helpful guide whenever we start automating stuff in Hypermesh, which is why uh, we need to keep in mind where this file is located. But as a beginner, for now, you don't have to do anything about all of these files. We will talk about these files maybe by end of tomorrow's session. Okay, so that is uh, the stuff about starting and stopping of Hypermesh. Next, uh, so this is what I meant by can Hypermesh remember its user, okay? So next, uh, this is basically what I was trying to do. So if you go to preferences here, uh, if you go to graphics area, this uh, menu will open up. You can also- oh, Saran, yes. sorry to interrupt. Uh, the participants are saying that the video is frozen ah, okay. and it Yes, my bad. So uh, I presented Hypermesh and not the complete screen. My bad. Uh, no problems. Okay, guys. So I have updated the share settings. Uh, is the PPT visible now? Yes. Perfect. Sorry about that. Okay. So now, uh, basically, this is what I was trying to do when I resized Hypermesh. So if you go to preferences here, uh, you have graphics as an option. So this is what we did, thick 1D elements. And then what you also have that I wanted to demonstrate is keyboard settings. So what are keyboard settings? Um, so as you can imagine, meshing is a time intensive job. So the expert in meshing or the experts in meshing, what they tend to do is whatever commands they use most prominently, they try to assign those commands into uh, some keys which are very much uh, you know uh, convenient for them. So for example, I think most of you must be into gaming. So for example, if you're playing Counter-Strike, what you do is you follow WASD, you know, forward, backward, left, right, stuff like that. So on similar lines, people try to tune in Hypermesh as per their needs. So whatever commands they use most frequently, they uh, sort of assign them to keyboard shortcuts. So that is what I wanted to demonstrate using this keyboard settings. Uh, maybe we can do that uh, when we actually start using Hypermesh. Okay, so after that, I have a couple of, or maybe a list of commands that you should know, uh, not essentially commands. Uh, these are basically start off points. So we have a general idea about the GUI. I have told you about the mouse clicks, uh, control plus what keys does what. We also have uh, an idea about command.tcl file and hmmenu.set file. Uh, regarding operating languages, so Hypermesh essentially operates on two languages. Uh, all the coding part that goes behind uh, the GUI that is done in TCL. Hence, you see the command file being written as a .tcl file. And then um, <clears throat> the second part is the GUI. This GUI is written using a language that is known as TK. 
so tcl stands for tool command language tk stands for tool kit okay so this is all about hypermesh uh, or maybe the overview about hypermesh now what we are going to do is we are going to understand uh, you know uh, what are these nomenclatures so component property material and assembly but before we do that i want you to remember what is our target okay so uh, let's say you have this bracket that i just showed and that is made up of uh, let's say uh, steel okay so whatever fea model that you are going to build or uh, to shorten it whatever pre processing that you are going to do it should resemble the steel bracket in real life in every way so what do i mean by resemble so first thing is uh, its shape its geometry its thickness everything has to be same as the physical uh, actual part second thing is the material so uh, we also need to somehow tell the software that okay the material for this is steel so when i say tell uh, as mechanical engineers we need to tell uh, the different properties of the material next um yeah so thickness material and yeah so i think with that we will be able to resemble the geometry now if this part is connected to some other part we also need to inform the software about this kind of connection so with this as a background i am going to introduce three terms one is component second one is property and the third one is material so just give me a minute until i put this back to its original position so we have some more area to work with so now um, if you noticed a while back what i had was you know just the geometry then uh, i have this mesh that is there but uh, there was no thickness assigned so this uh, switch on and off this uh, you know tab that you see on the left this is what is known as a component a component in hypermesh is an entity that stores uh, a lot of information containing uh, you know the overall shape of the part so let's say the geometry file you know the surfaces and all that is stored or if you are drawing any line even that will be stored inside this component and also maybe the mesh you know the fe entities so this is what a collector or a component stands for that is the purpose of a collector or a component so how do we create a collector just right click here say create and you can see component okay so if you just click here it will ask you to rename it if you want and you know that's all this thing can also be performed using the buttons here so this one is for component this one is for assembly this is for property this is for material so on and so forth so now you know what a component is so for now i am going to display this one component so uh, with this or with this mesh what i have achieved is i have captured the shape i have captured the geometry now what is missing is the thickness so this information on thickness that is stored by another entity that is known as property so that is what i created a while back so again if you go right click create a uh, property so this is basically arranged alphabetically so if you go to property uh, you will be again asked to rename the property and as if you scroll down here you will see that property has n number of options available n number of inputs available so t in most cases will stand for thickness so you type whatever value of thickness you want here say enter now uh, you have created the property you have created you know the thickness but still uh, the one thing that is missing is to link this property to the component okay so i will go again back to my component i will go to this property section here i'll click on this and i will assign the appropriate property so initially i created one now maybe i created two so i'll assign two okay so component and property together helps us model the geometry in the most uh, actual form okay so now if i remove uh, or maybe shade the elements and do a 2d detailed representation so if you have a look at Uh, this image on the screen you can easily make out that okay this resembles the original geometry in every way right now the last part that is missing is the material information so that will be conveyed by another entity known as 
should be here yeah material so again for material you have different inputs e g new so i think you are all familiar with this notations row is density and stuff like that so here if you just click and say enter by default it will take the values for steel and yeah so that should be it so similar to property we also need to link this material to our collector so we will again click on the collector in the materials tab we can you know assign the material so once you have assigned the material uh, once you have assigned all the properties to the material uh, you will be able to calculate the uh, you know the mass of the component and all of that so that will be done in uh, you know one of these uh, panels that you have so this is the basic nomenclature and understanding of uh, components properties and materials one last thing that is left for now is assemblies so assemblies basically uh, help us to you know put multiple components together so as you can imagine if you are thinking of the instrument panel it will have a large number of components so each of these component will be one collector so a group of all these components together will be called as an assembly okay so that is the basic convention behind component property material and assembly so we have already done this advanced remesh and free edge option uh, the thick 1d element option so what is advanced remesh what is free edge we will get to that in a bit but for now this is the basic setting keyboard shortcuts again uh, i can show you so just give me one moment i'll open up the dialog box and then i'll show it okay so i hope my screen is visible uh, here in this dialog box this is where you can see uh, you know your different keys so if you press on any particular key you will see what command it has and hypermesh by default has given us a nice array of commands so if you go to f1 it will say hm underscore call help so this is basically the code okay uh, if you just copy paste this let's say i'm just copying this and i'm pasting it into some other key okay then now if i press j same thing will happen so this is how you know you mix match our different key combinations with different commands so again this is just how to do it but which command do we really use uh, how to use it which is most useful all of that we will cover when we actually start meshing a component okay then next we have uh, yes this this views we need to talk about okay so right now uh, i need you to focus on these two boxes here one is this and the other one is this so one box reads auto one box needs uh, reads by component so uh, if you look at the icons closely this is the icon for cad and this icon is for the mesh so let me display both of them okay we'll do that one by one so this is basically the coloring option what you are essentially telling the software right now is color the component uh, using the color of the component that you can see here okay so this color is what is visible right now if i change this to this again the color changes but uh, the most useful view for us is by topology okay by 2d topology so you can also color the components by assembly or by part again by component is what i already explained and topology so let's go to 2d topology so now uh, you can see that uh, these colors have changed and these colors have very special importance and significance inside hypermesh so i ask all of you to pay very close attention to what i'm going to say right now okay so green colored edge uh, when you are talking about a cad a green colored edge essentially means that that edge is basically shared by two surfaces so if you focus on this edge here it is shared by one and two two surfaces right so similarly uh, the complete component if i put it in wireframe mode uh, it is a closed solid which is why all the edges are green okay now let me do something i will delete one particular surface let's say this 
And what you can see is now this solid has opened up, which is why we can see the insights and the edge color has changed to red, right? So if uh, this red colored edges are basically known as free edges, free edges uh, for a CAD is different and free edge for a mesh is different. So for a CAD, a red colored free edge means that this edge is not shared by any other surface. We only have one surface that connects this edge. Okay, so this is there. And then again, finally, if one particular edge is shared by, uh, let's say more than two surfaces, it turns to be yellow. So let me also show that, uh, forget what I'm doing. Uh, I just want you to uh, focus on the color. So maybe I'll demonstrate that as a different component itself. Okay. Uh, let me undo and yeah, so we are back to, yes, we are back to the old model. Okay. So different views. Okay. Yeah. We also need to talk about the view for mesh. So I will get back to the standard representation. So again, for mesh, we have different uh, kinds of coloring options. So we can mesh it by the color of the component, by the color of the property, material, assembly. If it's a 1D mesh, 2D mesh, 3D mesh, uh, the most widely used is by element quality. So again, what is element quality and all of that stuff, we will address it in tomorrow's session. But just note this that whenever you are measuring the quality of a mesh, okay, so uh, and someone has done a particular kind of mesh, then there are some uh, set criteria and set parameters which define how good that mesh really is. Okay, so these are some of the standard parameters and in element quality view, you get to see which element is failing in which kind of quality criteria. So what each of these quality criteria mean and that that is, you know, that comes maybe at stage four or five and we are right now barely starting with one. So don't be intimidated by this. Uh, remember the motto for this bootcamp. We just want to get into hypermesh, you know. Uh, so if you yourself launch hypermesh, you shouldn't be stuck anywhere. That is the only motto. Okay. So uh, like I said, don't worry about uh, the element quality and stuff like that. But just remember that this is how you can uh, have the coloring option. Okay. So right now I'm going to put it back into uh, by component option. Now I'm going to explain this red and yellow convention again with respect to your free edges. Okay. So uh, again, what operations I'm doing, forget about that. But there is something known as free edge for an element as well. So that I'm going to demonstrate. So now, as you can see, uh, when I performed some operation, suddenly we have a red colored border that has come up for the complete entity. So what does this mean? This means that all the elements that are attached to this line, uh, maybe I can highlight it. Yes. So all the elements that are attached to uh, this red colored entity, uh, they are not shared or maybe this edge is not shared by any element. Only one element is attached to this red colored entity. So if you focus on this edge that I have highlighted in white, the only element that is in contact with that edge is this. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is how you figure out uh, your free edges. Now, for example, uh, think about it this way that while meshing, I accidentally deleted these two elements. So if you have a look at the CAD, the surface is continuous, but if you look at the FEM mesh, then, you know, a few elements are missing here which means from an FEA perspective that there is a hole in this component here, but that is not really the case. And if we proceed with the simulation, we might get some errors here, which is why we again, you know, display the free edges and then we can easily make out that, okay, this is where I'm missing. Uh, I need to fill this up with uh, some elements. So let me fill it up with some elements and see uh, if the free edges are gone. So normally hypermesh isn't so slow. Uh, it's just the problem of the graphics. Okay. 
okay so right now i am actually building the element node by node just in a manner in which you might you know build a a geometric entity so again now i'm going to ask hypermesh to display the free edges for me first i'll delete the existing ones and i'll display it again and as you can see uh, once we fill it up with elements the free edges are gone in that location okay so this is what free edges is all about so i understand that this might be a bit difficult to grasp at the very first instance itself but trust me this is going to get simpler as we move forward right now what i'm trying to do is i'm just demonstrating different options uh, when we actually start working with one particular component it will be a lot easier so that is all about different kinds of views uh, free edges then geometry topology the uh, green colored edges that i already told you import export options we talked about solver decks also we talked about and then finally uh, yes the help panel so since i can't demonstrate it from here let me yeah so here if you click on this help icon you can access all the help that is available uh, provided by hypermesh or the people who developed hypermesh which is basically altaya so that you can access from this menu okay now we have a background of what hypermesh is now from this point onwards we will actually take one component and start meshing it okay so to explain meshing this is the simplest example i have okay so imagine that this is a square box or uh, maybe to put it even simpler imagine that you have a square cake and you want to divide this cake into equal parts for you know your colleagues or stuff like that so how would you do it your first cut would be something like this next cut something like this right so if you cut it like this then you will get 16 pieces and that is essentially how you will distribute it but imagine doing something similar for a triangle okay so now again if i follow the same rule i first put a cut like this next cut something like this 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 okay so now how would the mesh or basically what you are doing is you are uh, sort of distributing the infinite shaped cake into some finite countable entities right so here you uh, sort of created 16 entities here again you created some number of entities so this process of breaking down stuff into smaller entities this is what really meshing is all about so how will the mesh for a triangle look like it is basically something that looks like this okay so this is the manual process for meshing okay from here on all the operations that we do we are going to try and do them in the software that is hypermesh itself so on this point i would like to take a small pause and ask you for any doubts if you have okay i'm going to stop presenting for a while and go through the chat box okay i see a good question how do you give thickness to an uneven surface so that's a very good question and yes there are techniques to do that so what you do is you give different thickness to different set of elements so let's say you have a draft and your thickness varies from 1 to 2 then uh, for example let's say uh, you have five rows then each row uh, you will start incrementing the thickness so the first row will have thickness of 1 next row 1.2 1.4 1.6 1.8 and 2 so that is how you give thickness to a uh, a varying thickness product how to decide perfect mesh size again that is a good question um the answer to that is uh, it will be guided by the industry that you work with because there is something known as mesh validation studies or mesh conversion studies that happen in every industry and uh, those studies essentially give the result of the perfect mesh size okay so um free edge remesh how you do it so free edges are never basically remeshed okay free edge is just a display entity that you use to identify uh, if there are any problems with your mesh remesh operation is actually done on the remaining uh, entities that we just saw okay so this will be clearer once we go into the details um how does hypermesh distinguish between actual geometry holes and fea holes so uh 
again if you are switching on the geometry uh, like we just did uh, using the icon on the left hand side then uh, whatever display you have or uh, whatever uh, color coding you have that will be for the geometry once you switch off the geometry only fe is visible uh, you switch on your free edges and then uh, you will be able to see where the holes are located from an fe perspective uh, one good question that i see is quadrilateral and triangular meshing so these two shapes are basically the building blocks of fea now one might wonder why not use a pentagon hexagon you know you keep increasing the number of sides but the reason for that is uh, as you can imagine all of these uh, analysis that you do they are done by some solvers and solvers um, are basically codes so these codes they need quadrilateral and triangle as an input which is why we don't use uh, any other shapes hypermesh extension is dot hm conditions of mesh curve well okay yes tetra mesh in 3d yes if you are uh, meshing some component that is 3d uh, you do it using tetra mesh or a hexa mesh or something like that okay um guys what i see is uh, some of the questions that you ask uh they will be clarified when we actually work on one particular component right away so i would ask you to be a bit patient uh we will soon uh, get into it, uh, all those questions uh, when we actually start working um uh, is it important to master cad before entering ca not at all uh but some knowledge of cad would be great because sometimes what happens is the geometry that you get for meshing it is really bad so at least some basic operation on how you can uh, make that geometry simpler often helps so as a fe beginner what should we learn answer hypermesh well, that's a tough question uh, the simpler answer to that would be uh, let's say if you have any particular company in mind or particular industry in mind you should know what software they are using and uh, then you should go for that software but in my opinion both of the softwares have um you know the rough philosophy behind the softwares is the same which is why uh, at times it is much easier to switch between these two softwares as well okay so what is hyperworks okay so there is a company known as altair they have a product suit known as hyperworks and one of the products of hyperworks is hypermesh there are n number of products that come under hyperworks but uh you know right now we are only dealing with hypermesh okay so difference between different solver decks um you know a uh, stuff like that let's not answer it right away because it's too soon to tell uh, even if i explain it uh, you won't be able to grasp it which is why let's uh, you know park your questions for that uh for fea industry uh, you have to master hypermesh there is no way out just knowing the basics of a software is going to take you nowhere uh only reason being that is uh, the stuff that you are learning now it's barely the surface hypermesh and you know all the activities that industries perform in hypermesh uh, i can't even begin to explain how wide a variety there is okay so uh knowing just the basics of a software uh it's a good start but you eventually will have to master the software if you want to sustain in this industry all right uh the other questions i think for now let's not uh, take them because you know we have limited time okay so uh let's start with um you know the same example this square and a triangle so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to start with some a very a very basic geometry and with that geometry as a starting point we will begin this journey of actually meshing a component in hypermesh okay so uh, like you do for cad for starting off uh, any entity you need to begin with a point so to do that in hypermesh uh, again if we are using fea as our base we need nodes so i'm going to hit f8 and my nodes panel will appear 
my first node i am assuming it to be at 000, zero. so create and f so this is my first node now um, i'm going to show you a variety of operations that we can do okay so there are n number of ways to create a square for example uh, by square i mean a square surface okay so uh, i could actually use uh, the coordinate system so 000 100 0 uh, then 100 100 and 0 100 so this will be the coordinate system but intentionally i'm not doing it that way because i want to show you all the different stuff that we can do around in hypermesh okay so from here on i'll be a bit slow so that all of you can grasp it so okay so this is the first node now what i'm going to do is for generating the second node i'm going to move this node in let's say the x direction uh, by 100 units okay uh, so i will first select the node but what will happen is if i move it my previous node will move away right so okay so uh, if i'm saying move this original node position is changed hence i won't be able to use this node to create the square anymore so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say node duplicate now that the node is duplicated as you can read on the left hand side of the screen even if i press translate my original node is still retained and the new node is now created here okay so with these two nodes now i will start building uh, you know the square now the next thing that i'm going to do is i'm going to draw a line connecting these two nodes but as i mentioned when we create any geometric entity it is saved in a component so the current component in which everything is going to be saved is shown here but for simplicity i will create one more component let's call it um, first okay so as you can see whatever uh, current component is there that is displayed here so now to uh, you know create the geometry i'm going to go to this geometry panel i'm going to click on lines i'm going to uh, create the line by using the second option okay so you can also create a line by specifying the coordinates but since we already have the nodes i'm going to use the second option so this is my first node this is my second node and i'm going to say create okay so my line is created now if i switch on and off as you can see the line is being switched on and off implying that this line is being saved in this component okay now if i wanted to generate uh, a surface from a line uh, in a cad what i would have done uh, i would have simply swept this line along a guide or by some distance in a particular direction right so I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to go to 2D. So this basically is 1D meshing, 2D meshing, and 3D meshing. I'm going to say drag. So by drag, what I mean is I'm going to either use a line or I can use a node. So I'm going to use the line. I will select the line. I will drag it, let's say, along the Y axis that I can select here and by a distance of 100 mm. Now here I get an option to uh, to see the output. So I can either create only a surface, I can create the mesh simultaneously while creating the surface, and mesh without surf mesh delete surface and mesh without surface. So these are the four options available. Right now, since I'm demonstrating the CAD to you, I am clicking on surface only, and I'm going to say drag. So as you can see, our surface has been generated. Right. And since we are in the 2D topology mode, all the edges are red, indicating that this surface is not shared by any other surface. Okay, now let's get to the part that we were all waiting for. I'm going to press F12. So F12 basically is uh, the shortcut key for auto mesh, right? So auto mesh is a command in hypermesh which helps you mesh any given surface. I'm going to go to surfaces. This is where I specify the element size. So as you know, we have this distance as 100 mm. 
So if I say 25, I will break this down into four parts along length and four parts along height. So all in all, we will have 16 parts just like we did in uh, the example that I just showed. So here I select my surface, I say mesh. Just a moment. Okay, so as you can see, Hypermesh has done the job well. We have four, four elements along each length. And if you suddenly realize that, okay, I need more elements, I can just click on four, five, six, and stuff like that. You can do it for all the, you know, all the different sites, and I can just say mesh. For now, I'm going to stick to four and return. Okay, so this is how our mesh for this part looks like. Now, uh, let me do the same exercise for a triangle. So in order to generate a triangle, I'm going to use uh, the nodes from this square itself. So this is the first node. This is the second node. This is the third node. Uh, let's use the translate operation. And again, this time I'm using, I'm going to translate it along Y axis. One thing I forgot to mention. So this translate command is shift F4. Okay, so if you press shift and if you press F4, uh, you will be able to, you know, sort of uh, access this panel. Again, I'll say duplicate and I'll say translate. Okay, so this is now our, you know, the triangle that we were looking for. Now the square we generated by, let's say using the drag operation. Um, here, I'm going to do something different. Here, I can directly create the mesh. So for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, click on F6 or press F6. F6 is my element edit panel. Uh, I'm going to say create. Uh, one thing to note is if I create the element now, it will go into the same collector that I have. So instead of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename it as square and I'm going to create another collector create component and let's call it trya back to f6 create and if i say create my triangle is generated now one thing to notice here uh, we have one element but here uh, what i mean is we have one smaller element here but if we look here we have one very huge element right so hypermesh also has an option where we can remesh our one big element to you know break it down into smaller elements. So again, uh, here I change the option from surface to elements. For uh, I'm still keeping the mesh size as 25. I'm going to click on mesh. So you know this is how the mesh is being generated for the triangle. Now hypermesh has its own algorithm which determines how a particular mesh is being generated. And this is the best possible design that Hypermesh basically gave us. Okay, so this is a rough idea on how meshes are generated. So uh, like I mentioned before, our size for the square was uh, 100 mm. If we set an average size of 25, that would meet four elements. So this line is basically divided into four parts using these nodes. Uh, same goes for all the other lines and these nodes are connected together to form elements. So that in short is what an auto mesh operation is all about. So again, let me take a quick pause and let me hear from you if auto mesh is clear to you because this was our first meshing operation so far. So if anything is unclear, just uh, drop your queries in the chat box. Uh, one query which you might have is uh, how do I know the shortcuts for all these different commands? So uh, I will show that in a bit. But apart from that, if you have any other queries, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to answer. Okay. So some want it to be done again, not an issue. We will definitely handle one more component. So everything will be clear. So any specific queries guys, or is it clear for everyone? Uh, 
uh, for 3D uh, meshing, we will address that as a separate module tomorrow. Okay. Um, so I can see that a lot of you are saying repeat. So for sure, I'll be happy to do that. Let me just quickly present it. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll delete everything. So we have um, just a moment. Um, so what I'll do is I'll use uh, the geometry as a reference point and from there we will start meshing. Okay. So just ignore what I'm doing for a moment. Uh, to tell you uh, in short, what I did right now is I generated a surface from the FEA entities that we had. If you go to F2, you can delete all the elements and all the different kinds of uh, entities that are available. So if you click on this arrow here, uh, you get to choose what you want to delete. So if you want to delete elements, click here for components, click here and so on. Okay, so I'm deleting this. Okay, uh, if I set it into component view, so this is one com component, this is another component. And remember, this is not an element anymore. Uh, I have clicked on the element display. This is not an element. This is a CAD, right? As you can see, if I do this, these are both CAD, okay? So now uh, I will not show how we generated the surfaces. We will just focus on the auto mesh operation because uh, as you know, you will already have the CAD with you, right? So creating CAD is not your job. Uh, I just wanted to show you that because I wanted to explain translate operation, uh, create element operation and stuff like that. But to start off, auto mesh operation should work for most of you. Okay. So again, I am going to click on F12. Okay. Immediately when I press F12, this goes into a topology display. I will click on surface. I will select the surface. I'll put whatever average size I want. This time, let me put it to 10. So by 10, uh, what I mean is 100 by 10 is 10. So I'll have 10 elements along every direction. I can also mesh different surfaces at the same time. And I click on mesh. So as you can see now, uh, our square has been meshed perfectly uh, using uh, you know different smaller squares. And so is our triangle. So as you can imagine here, this one edge that was there in the square is missing, which is why uh, we have a lot of trias because uh, when you have a triad, two nodes combined together. So for example, if I want to show you how a tria is created, uh, Hypermesh gives you an option to merge two nodes together. So if I click on F3, Okay, so I've clicked on F3. I click one node, I click second node. And what Hypermesh will do is Hypermesh will combine those two nodes together to form a, you know, a triangular element. Okay, so this is how triangular elements are created. <clears throat> um, opposite trias and all of these terminologies we will deal with a bit later because since we are dealing with the basics, uh, let's focus on the basics. So this is how uh, you know your automated mesh operation will work. If I now want to you know improve the mesh here, I will uh, again go to F12. I will select elements. I'll select this set of elements. Uh, one more thing: if you press your middle mouse button, that also functions as OK. So yes. Uh, yeah, so that is how your remesh operation worked on your elements. Okay. So I hope this is clear now. Um, any queries still? Guys, any queries? Uh, please drop down. So the mesh on a triangle appears different because as you can imagine, we are missing one complete side, which is why the number of nodes that were 10, they need to be reduced. 
So in order to reduce these nodes, uh, as I just showed you, two nodes combined together to give you a tri element, and that is how hypermesh uh, meshes the tri elements. Okay, wonderful. So from here on, uh, like we we meshed the very basic shapes as of now. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you uh, if you are given any particular component from the industry, how uh, would you actually mesh that kind of component? Okay, uh, so, okay, this has finally happened. So let me, okay, so if you go to preferences here and if you go to keyboard settings, now we were using F12, right? So if I click on F12, you will see that HM underscore push panel auto mesh. So this is where you can locate all the different shortcuts. But if you want to actually locate this command in hypermesh, then that will be located in these panels. So we used the translate operation. So that was with the shift key. So I'll go to shift F4 translate. Similarly, I used F6. So if I click on F6, I can say HM push panel edit element. So that is the command and so on and so forth. So this is how you know you have a look at all the different shortcuts. But as I mentioned, if you are someone who has no idea on hypermesh, all the commands are located here. I strongly advise to use the shortcuts because only then you will come up to the meshing standards that the industry demands. Okay, so if you go to 2D, uh, this is basically meshing. So you can see auto mesh operation here. So if you click on auto mesh again, the auto mesh panel opens up. Uh, you should locate translate and all of this stuff here as well. Okay. So with that, uh, now we can actually start working on, uh, you know, uh, the industry parts. So uh, I suppose uh, it is a bit too much to grasp everything on this instant. So I will quickly scroll through the slides. Uh, maybe you can take up a pen and a paper and if you have, or if you remember any doubts, just note them down and uh, we can address them later. So this was the overall, uh, you know, overall picture. Then we went into uh, OEM and ODM terminology. We had a look at, uh, you know, the simulation department in an automotive industry. Uh, the different blocks of the simulation department, which are pre-processing analysis and post-processing. Uh, since meshing comes under pre-processing, we had a deeper look into the pre-processing department. First one was meshing, second was depenetration, uh, which is basically removal of intersections. We had connections and finally we had the tech setup. Then I explained to you what all is demanded out of a CAE engineer. Then finally we entered hypermesh GUI and inside the GUI we uh, located which commands are located where. Uh, we also understood how to pan, zoom, and operate hypermesh. Uh, we also learned about command, uh, command.tcl and HM menu set files. We understood how component property material assembly is linked together. <clears throat> we are yet to discuss this advanced remesh option, but I'll tell about it very soon. Uh, free edge, yes, we have addressed that. We have addressed keyboard shortcuts. Uh, we now know how to have different looks from a CAD perspective and a mesh perspective. So the topology uh, coloring. Then uh, we also discussed the import export options, the solver decks, and also how to address the help. Okay, so here uh, in this slide, we actually meshed a component manually. So by manually, I mean literally using, let's say a scale and a pencil. And same operation we later performed in hypermesh. Okay, so that was our journey so far. Uh, we are now at the last part of today's session where we will open up a solid. We will see how hypermesh actually, uh, you know, sort of uh, meshes that solid. And that would be uh, the last point for today's session. So again, uh, with this overview, any queries or can I proceed? So uh, if you want me to proceed, just type in yes, if any queries are there. Okay, great. Perfect, thank you guys. Okay, so uh, this file that I wanted to show today, it has a lot of components, but 
that was the intention because i wanted to demonstrate assemblies components and properties from tomorrow on we will uh, move on with a file that has just one component so it is much easier for you guys to understand so uh, if i show you the complete file right now it has all of these different uh, you know sort of components and if you remember assemblies that i mentioned a while back this is how assemblies can be helpful so there is something known as sheet metal part and uh, we have some parts that will be needing hexa mesh so what are these how did i decide that just forget that but those are the two categories that i used and i have turned that into an assembly so again i'll hide all of these and now if i open the cad for one particular assembly all the parts that will need sheet metal mesh are displayed similarly if i switch on the mesh then the mesh for those parts will be displayed and same goes for the hexa components as well okay so this is how you can use assemblies uh, at your disposal okay so now uh, as a first exercise i am going to show you how uh, did i build the mesh for this component okay um so just to uh, keep it simple and start it from scratch i am going to copy this uh, component or all of these surfaces into a new collector and i'm going to delete everything else so that it is much easier for you to understand okay so i am creating one more final collector shift f11 is the command that will help you organize entities okay see it is written here organize entities so what i want to do i want to copy or i want to rather move these surfaces into the current component so it is surfaces here i am going to hold down shift and drag and drop and then i'm going to say let's say copy for now okay return now i'm going to hide the original component so only component 3 is being displayed now here is where uh, hypermesh has a lot of variety okay so i'm going to delete everything else how do i do that i'm going to go to the delete panel this time i'm not going to delete the elements i'm going to delete the components so now uh, you know this is like uh, using some logic so i want to delete everything except the component that is being displayed okay so i'm going to translate this statement into how hypermesh would do it delete everything except the displayed part so first i'm going to select the displayed part how do i do that i'm going to click on components components sorry displayed okay so as you can see one component is added by displayed i'm going to say select again i'm going to go to components here i have an option to say reverse okay so by reverse what i mean is except displayed everything else is selected so uh, that appears here return and delete so as you can see all the other components are now deleted so that makes my life a lot easier similarly i am going to uh, let's say delete these properties and assemblies as well so i am going to use the uh, the simpler way i can hold down control and click on all of these and then just say delete here it asks me an option to whether delete the children entities as well i am going to say no and hit okay right so now i think this would be much easier to understand we only have one component and this one component only has cad and nothing else so this would be our starting point now like i mentioned this is a 3d component and what we want to do is we want to mesh it there are two approaches one is to use the 2d building blocks which are square and triangle and then assign a thickness to them so that we have the 3d representation another approach is to use 3d elements at itself so for example if you extrude a square it turns out to be a hexagon if you similarly extrude a triangle you will have another entity so typically the entity triangular 3d entity that is used is the tetrahedron in hypermesh as a convention the parts which have finite thickness say up to 4 5 mm they are meshed using the first approach of using 2d entities okay so uh in conclusion we are going to use 2d entities now 
if you remember when we meshed the square we had one surface at the center or forget it so we only had one surface that we meshed now we need this surface at the center of this part so that we can create a mesh on that mid surface and then assign thickness to it so this is the philosophy of hypermesh whenever you are creating the mesh uh, or the mid surface mesh for any component by mid surface mesh what i mean is a mesh that is there at the center of the component so hypermesh has an option to create the mid surface for any given closed solid so that option is located here you go to geometry you go to mid surface keep it auto for now uh, to select the surfaces what you can do is you can click on any of the surface and all the connected closed solid faces will be selected and then you simply say extract okay so as you can see one more component is created whose name is mid surface and this is how this is how it looks like okay so this was your original component and this is the mid surface component now what is so special about this mid surface so if you observe closely this mid surface as the name suggests is at the center of the cad right so now what we are going to do is we are going to mesh this mid surface and then assign it a particular thickness so that uh, it will resemble the actual cad representation so i'll switch this off now i will go into the topology mode and now i'm only working on the mid surface okay so now as you all know our first step would be say saying f12 then uh, let me set the element size to be 5 i'm going to select the surface i'm selecting all the surfaces to start off and i'm going to say mesh okay so now uh, if you just have a layman look, what you will see is this isn't very, you know, a regular mesh. For example, uh, these lines, they are uh, somehow curved. We have a lot of triangular elements and stuff like that. Also, your holes are somehow improper. And, you know, there's a lot of problems with this mesh. So if you remember the mesh that I showed in the beginning, it was very well uh, structured. Uh, it was very visually appealing and so on. So now uh, our job as meshing engineers is to improve the quality of this mesh. So as you can see, if I am in the element quality view, I have uh, different colors, which means that uh, these elements are failing into these different qualities. So again, my job as a meshing engineer here would be to improve the quality of mesh. In order to do that, I should know uh, what are the uh, you know, the guiding principles of this mesh. So in order to do that, I'm going to switch on these, uh, this icon here, display fixed points, also known as hard points. And what you will be able to see is hypermesh is trying to put a node and on all of these hard points, right? So uh, what that means is if I add a hard point anywhere, hypermesh by default will uh, you know, sort of create a mesh or insert a node at that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to guide hypermesh on how my mesh should look like. So how do I do that? I'm going to go to F11. I'm going to click on node. So this is the geometry edit panel. So what geometry editing we are going to do and why we are doing it, I will explain that as we do it. So like I mentioned, I noticed that we could have had a better mesh here. So I'm going to select this node. I'm going to select this node. And now there is a green line here, right? Similarly, I'm going to connect this node to this node. Again, I have a line there. I'm going to go to F12. Again, I'm going to select all the surfaces and I'm going to say mesh. So as you can see, hypermesh has started to follow the line that I am giving it, right? Now this is where uh, the remesh or the advanced remesh option that we turned off comes into picture. So let me show you what advanced remesh can do. Okay, so now uh, my advanced remesh is on. What I am doing right now is let's say 
I'm creating another line. So for example, I'm clicking this node and I'm clicking at any random location on this line. Okay. So as you can see, a line was created and automatically the mesh was adapted in such a manner that, you know, automatically this line is being followed. So I'll repeat same exercise. I will use the second option now. So second option is uh, the first input would be node. The next input would be line and hypermesh will drop a normal from that point on that line. Okay. So as you can see, my mesh flow has started to improve dramatically. Right. So, uh, you know, this is how, uh, you guide hypermesh into making a better and better mesh. Okay. Same thing I can do in the reverse way. Uh, let's say there is a particular line that I don't want hypermesh to follow. So I can go to toggle edge and click on that line. So automatically hypermesh will not follow that line. Okay. So this is the basic or maybe the basic logic of how you can improve your mesh and your mesh flow. Okay. So as you can see here, there were hard points, which is why hypermesh has, you know, uh, put the nodes there. Let me change the orientation of the hole. How I'm doing it right now. Don't pay attention to it. We'll discuss it, uh, in an elaborate view tomorrow. So I have selected this line and I have told hypermesh that, okay, uh, put three points on that line. And now I'm going to remove some of those points. So shift and right click will deselect shift and left click will select. So as you can see, if my hole is aligned along the direction of the flow, immediately my mesh quality has started to improve this versus this, right? So this is the difference. Uh, uh, what comes into play when you know how to do your geometry modifications. Okay. So, uh, at this point, I would leave it up to you. Uh, if it's too much to grasp today, I am willing to take this forward tomorrow as well. Or if you allow me, I will show you how to improve the flow of this mesh. So how are we going to do that? Well, the simple answer is if you observe closely, this component is symmetric about the X, Y plane, right? So let's say if I cut this component in half along the center plane, then it is quite possible that uh, I don't have to mesh on, uh, you know, I don't have to mesh the complete component. I can only mesh one half of it. And the remaining half I can, you know, simply uh, just ignore. So in order to generate, uh, you know, the half, or maybe the splitting plane, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create three nodes. First, I'll go to F8. Uh, F8 is your panel for creating temp nodes. I'm going to go to this fourth option here. I'm going to insert three nodes on this line. So when I say three nodes, what happens is two nodes will be the endpoints of the line and the last node or the third node will be at the center. So this is my first line. This is my second line and this is my third line. Okay. So uh, now just, you know, look at the magic. I will go to surface edit or rather I'll go to surfaces. Sorry, my bad. We'll go to surface edit. We will say trim surfaces or planes. And we are going to trim the complete surface with the help of a plane that is defined by nodes. Okay. So for selecting the surfaces, shift plus left click. Oh, sorry, my bad. Okay. Yes, the surface is selected. And now we are selecting the nodes. First node, second node, and third node. You can notice the color conventions as well. N1 is green, N2 is blue, and N3 is uh, red. So it is also asking us as an additional input for base point. But uh, if uh, you have only given three points, three points essentially define a plane. So you don't need any additional input. Now, finally, I'm going to say trim. 
And as you can see, my one half of the mesh is already very well organized. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to make my life easier. I'm going to delete the complete mesh. I'm also going to delete the surfaces that I don't need. So again, shift, drop and drag, delete. Okay, so this makes my life a lot easier. Now, the last thing that I'm going to do is I am also going to uh, sort of divide my geometry into a uh, little squares. Okay, so the more I divide it into squares, the easier it is going to be for hyper mesh to, uh, you know, create a smooth mesh. Okay, so first thing is I'm going to do the same exercise for this hole. Okay, so this orientation and this orientation is perfect. I'm also going to connect these two together so that the mesh flow is perfect across this mesh. Next, since I've connected this here, I can also go ahead and connect it here. And finally, from this point to this point, this point to this point. Why leave this line? So, yeah. So now, as you can see, with this level of geometry cleanup or you know topology enhancement, our mesh that is going to be generated is going to be incredible in the first go itself. Okay, so let's see where how far we have reached. So F12 surfaces, select them all and say mesh. So as you can see guys, we have a decent mesh. If I just, you know, change the mesh number, we will get as many number of squares as we can possibly manage. So a good mesh is typically the one which has lesser number of trias. So that is the first convention that maybe you can remember. Okay, so uh, we are good to go so far. We have quads almost everywhere and Yes, the mesh uh, looks good. Okay. All right, so for now, let us stick to this mesh. So as you can see, we have a very regular arrangement of elements here. And also uh, all the squares are very well placed. Only problem is I can, uh, so okay, just focus on these two triangular elements. This is what is known as an opposite trier. So if two triers are facing opposite to each other, it is possible to convert them into a square. So how? Just go to F12, select elements, uh, select the opposite triers and you know some elements near it. Make sure that uh, as far as possible, you select uh, a shape that resembles a square or a rectangle and just say mesh. So if I reduce this number here, Yes, now we have a good looking, you know, a square and least trier mesh. You can also remove this trier manually. Uh, instead of midpoint, I'm going to replace this node with this node. Okay, so what has happened is once I did this, uh, my element quality has started to fail. So let's see which color this is. This is maximum angle chord. So this means my this element has a maximum angle that is greater than 135. And as you can see, this angle is the one which is, uh, you know, uh, failing. So let me quickly show you how to fix that. We are going to use translate option. Shift F4. I'm going to select this node. This time, instead of one axis, I'm going to specify the direction using N1 and N2. So this is N1, this is N2. So the node that I've selected will move from this point to this point by the distance that I specify here. So translate plus and immediately uh, it is clear of quality. So this gray color is, uh, you know, the best quality that you have. So for now, let us assume that, you know, this is the best possible mesh that I can have. So now the only option remaining is to, you know, reflect it for the other half that is done by tools. Uh, there should be a reflect option here. What am I reflecting? I'm reflecting the elements. So I'm selecting the elements. 
Again, I will define a plane using three points. I'm going to say reflect. But now what has happened is the original elements also have changed their position. So what I need to do is I'm going to click on elements again. I'm going to say duplicate original component and reflect. So now if I open my original CAD, you can see that my mesh is, uh, you know, filling up the complete component. So we are done, right? Well, the answer is no, because uh, see, when we reflect it, we also need to connect these two meshes together. So what do I mean by that? Let's say if I go to shift F3 and say display the free edges. So if you remember what I explained about free edges, ideally the free edge should only have been at the boundary. But we also see a free edge at the center of the component. So this is one of the biggest problems that we face in the FEA industry. And this uh, is what we are going to address tomorrow. And uh, this is the exact point from where we will uh, start off tomorrow's session. Okay, so we will first understand what are the problems that we face in the industry and how it is fixed inside Hypermesh. So we will start off from this point. We will again assign property, assign material to this component and check it against uh, the original CAD available. So that will be the first part. In the second part, we will take a further complex component uh, that will demand a bit more of geometry cleanup. And, you know, uh, we will take it from there. Also, as I mentioned, the most, uh, you know, another interesting part about tomorrow's session is going to be, uh, you know, the automation that we are going to do with Hypermesh.